Music is like root work. Magic that's pulled up from the soil. It echoes on the stony hills and spins in the tall grass by the sea. It soothes the savage beast and pierces the soul of a man. Music is that old witchcraft. It writes your true name on a scrap of paper and makes you dance undignified like King David. This is the Hoodoo Music Podcast. This is the Hoodoo Music Podcast, episode 7. This episode, we've got The Guilty Remnant. Why don't you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves? I'm Josh from The Guilty Remnant, play drums. Andrew Dosher, guitar, vocals. Yep, and uh, your bass player Brad had to leave after we did the music session. Why don't we go ahead and just uh, talk about this first song real quick. Give us a little bit of an idea about what it's about, you know. Uh, Cigarette in the Back Steps, kind of self-explanatory. Um... Uh, it's about a fight and uh you know it's the uh the first song off of an ep we've been writing uh, called empty home and it's telling the story of a relationship as it goes through and begins to fall apart um <clears throat> cigarettes the first uh song and you know everyone's been there to where you just have to walk outside and get away from it and stand out and just So that way you're just not in the same room with them. One more. 
isn't home, but I can't fix it. So, uh, so how'd you guys meet? Um, you know, what, what brought the band together? <laughs> I was about to say, um, birth, uh, that's how we met. Um, no, me, me and Andrew were cousins, and uh, we're only, what, two, three years apart, something like that. And uh, We lived on the same compound. Yeah, that's our, our grandmother was very uh, maternalistic and was a true matriarch of the family, bless her soul. And she actually had a uh, dream for all of her grandkids to be in a... Uh, gospel band together um, everyone got to pick their instrument but they couldn't pick the same instrument as somebody else my older brother got an acoustic guitar first and because he got the acoustic guitar I was like well I'll get the electric guitar and play rock but my grandmother thought that was uh, double music so <laughs> I ended up getting a drum pad not even a full drum set just a drum pad and I had to play that for a year to earn a drum set uh, Andrew was the fourth in line and he got a mandolin because at that point, guitar, drums, and piano were taken. So uh, he kind of got stuck with that, learned to play it for a while. And then just... I didn't know what that was at the time. She said, uh, yeah, if, you, <clears throat> if I buy you a mandolin, will you play it? And I said, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> and from there, you uh, started playing banjo, and then you what, moved on to a guitar after banjo? Or... Uh, I, the banjo has eluded me in all these years. Oh, yeah? I thought you did banjo second. Uh, no, I'm a fake banjo player. Uh, uh, gu- guitar was, well, I can I can play it, but I can't play it like a banjo player. Uh, guitar was my second instrument, or piano, I guess technically. Well, so what? I guess what drove you to explore the musical styles you play now? Um, I was in a band called Dark Before Dawn um, in the early 2010s, back in the day, and played drums for them. Um, we were a hardcore band. Uh, had a lot of fun to, you know being in a band teaches you a lot about music just uh, forces yourself to get better and life kind of started to happen to all of us because we, we started when we were you know late teenagers and then next thing you know four or five years has gone down the road and we're all having real jobs and stuff like that and it's harder to get together and practice twice a week and get weekends off to go play shows yeah so uh, you know the band kind of fell apart and we've been uh, I've been kind of drifting musically we had a me and Andrew uh, had a failed attempt at a band that we will not name because it's cursed. And it was... It was a long, drawn-out failure. Uh, yeah, it, it, was, it, just, it, was, it was six months set, to fail. Set, but like two or, or three separate attempts, uh, like several months at a time. Yeah, it was, we had about four different people that kept trying to come in and out. At one point, I even switched to bass just to accommodate people and it was kind of one of those things where it's like we all like hanging out together but we all suck playing music together and it's it's like you know you want to have a band with your friends and your friends all suck and you suck at the time because like i said i switched instruments for that yeah we one. we needed another another good musician i think that we in any incarnation we needed another really good musician who was a committed musician yeah and there's a uh, lot of there was a lot of uh in the band where it's like oh I can practice once a month and we'll hope we can get better and you know, play a show in two weeks <laughs> and yeah it's like you know it's it's just it's like okay let's just have fun jamming and not call this anything serious but um, after that one failed uh, Andrew had Fonta Flora I'll let him talk about that one uh, so started a band with uh, a friend in college uh, sort of on hiatus now. We play. Uh, we haven't played a show in a while. 
but uh, that was a, a great experience for me. Uh, it's where I started my song, finally started songwriting. Uh, I was the uh, supporting member of that band, but uh, just learned a lot about music, uh, playing with my friend. That was a two piece. Uh, and after after that started that sort of started floundering when I got uh, a new job that started taking up all of my time it's amazing how uh, jobs do that <laughs> life imitates art and then gets in the way of art yeah but after that uh, when him and Fonta Flora were on a break we uh, ended up just meeting up around Thanksgiving and having a jam session before Thanksgiving I had started building uh, acoustic guitars and he wanted to come over and check it out and like I pulled out the drum set and we started hopping on and we're like you know why don't we just do this uh it was just it started out with just me and him jamming and he had a couple songs that he had written uh that weren't taken up by his other bands so we're just like yeah let's just do this and he was gonna take his uh role as front man and I was back to my you know true love drums and it started to where we were just gonna get together and jam and it kind of happened to where we were showing up every week sometimes twice a week and just kept doing it and we're like i guess this is a thing now yeah there was a point at which i said well, well what are we doing this and you and you said yes we're doing this and, yeah, it was, <laughs> and that yeah. was that was when the band was official but yeah and then it took us another three months to find a name and another six months to find a bassist uh we got our first show booked yeah, which is uh, at gusto fest uh, shout out to jason and his crew uh, no one likes your band they put on a hell of a show uh, Gusto Fest always fun. You were there for that um, back in August at the Soundbox. I think I was uh, the. Or were you? There? No, I was the one in early October oh, okay. when you well, played you there mean... with uh, Total Astronaut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those yeah, that was, that, was, that was a real fun show with those guys. Them and the Apartment Club were were, fan, were fantastic bands, and great to jam yeah, with. Um, but yeah, Gusto Fest is uh, Jason's, uh, also known as Hideous. It's his music festival has started out at the back of you know someone's house and he's brought it up to where it's you know two three hundred people show up every year and uh we got to play there as the opening act and he uh he's like you know i know you josh so i'll just take you aside on scene you better deliver and at that point me and andrew had three songs as a (laughs) guitar and drum crew and we're like all right well we'll just go find a bassist and uh don't know if any of ever bands have actually looked for a bassist. Apparently, it's like finding WMDs in Iraq. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> um, so uh, later on, uh, our buddy Brad, we uh, I called him up, and Brad played guitar in Dark Before Dawn. We asked him to come over and just you know try his hand at bass. And, you know, it's him switching from guitar to bass, so it's a different instrument for him, and he just blew it out of the water at the first practice. It was like a, it was like manna from heaven. Uh, he couldn't have asked for somebody <laughs> better to show yeah. up. And he came in, what, two months, two and a half months for the show? You may be exaggerating <laughs> the amount of time. Yeah, I know it, yeah. I didn't, it seemed like two weeks. It was I, I more than that. Was, I think it was about seven or eight practices worth, so that's at least two months. Or actually, it could have been six weeks because we doubled duty a lot. But he, uh, he picked it up, learned all the songs enough for the show, and it was kind of one of those hired gun situations at first. It was like, let's see if he uh, let's see if he sticks around and is committed. And, and me and Brad have had such a great chemistry from back in Dark Before Dawn. And on that first show, like we were looking at each other in the eyes like we used to do on stage and giving each other cues and just fell right back into it. Um, it was It's just fantastic that that worked out so well. And we played five shows or five songs for our first set, and... Uh, we were supposed to have a total of 15 minutes and we timed out the five songs and it came to 23 minutes. So we tried to figure out how to cut enough of it off to get it to the show. And actually when we played that first show, we were a little nervous about getting all the songs in and keeping the time constraints right. So I think we finished the set in like 16 minutes and we just played (laughs) everything at light speed. Um, we had been given permission to go ahead and do the full 20 minutes, and we ended up just cutting it even shorter. We played everything almost double speed for that first set. Wow. Um, it was it was real That's fun. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Especially I don't, I don't even remember any of it. It was it was over in a, in a moment. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's we, we got done with the fourth song, and like we were starting the intro to the fifth song, and we all kind of looked at each other like, we we doing good on time? Like, I mean, are we done with this set? Oh, my God. Um <laughs> But it was, we got a huge crowd reaction from that. And uh, it was one of those things where it's like, we're going to do at least one show. 
see if we like it, see if we don't, you know, going to keep this going. And, and when you uh, get a good reaction from the crowd, it's really rewarding. It was, it was fantastic. Uh, the fans were great. Uh, one of the best comments I had was from a friend that came out, and she goes, uh, you know, I, I came out to support you guys thinking you are going to suck, and now it's like I actually like the sound. Uh, it's not just like if, if I didn't know you, I would come see this show again. And uh, it's when you're when you're a fledgling band, it's a pretty cool uh, thing to get. You know, you gotta realize that every major band that's out there had to start from somewhere playing a show yeah. in someone's backyard, playing in a garage. You gotta make that first step, and from we just kind of went from zero to sixty. Cool. Well, uh, this next song, you know, you, you guys are talking about writing songs and, and putting them uh, putting them into a set that uh, ends up taking less time than and we actually had to cut it short the cops got called on us when we were recording earlier that's so how you know we're playing good rock and that's roll that's how you know you're playing good rock and roll what's this song about Andrew? I'm going to have to backtrack a little bit here uh, to when we formed uh, before that I was looking at taking uh, most of my material is more folk based uh, I was looking at putting together a band but uh, if if with a drummer a more minimalistic setup uh, yeah, I don't do minimalism so <laughs> so when me and Josh you know decided you know we're gonna take the show on the road uh, I had can I we kind of had to change the uh, change the goals and the song set that we're working with and this song was actually written uh that's the second song. It's called Hobohemia. Um, it's it was written as a gypsy folk song. Uh, a lot of Tom Waits influence. Some Django Reinhardt, something like that. Yes. Uh, so that that's what I was going for, but it, it turns out uh, it's got that steady uh, that steady beat to it. It's pretty easy to kind of turn into a Jack White blues jam. So that's sort of that's sort of. Uh, the evolution of the of the band right there yeah if it, we'll, we'll probably keep that demo buried but uh if you hear the original demo for it versus what it sounds like now it's almost two completely different songs uh luckily the lyrics are still intact and it's about going on a bender and it's all played in reverse it's when you wake up the next day from the bender and trying to put the pieces of the last night together kind of a dude's, dude where's my car scenario uh, yeah except uh with <laughs> except, lots more gambling in uh except in deadwood <laughs> yeah <laughs> nice very well very nice deadwood's a cool town you ever been yes yeah deadwood's incredible one of us has <laughs>
Now, Josh, earlier you mentioned uh, that it took you guys a while to come up with a name. Where where does the guilty remnant come from? Uh, the guilty remnant comes from a Tom Parada novel called The Leftovers. Uh, it was also made into a show on HBO. I saw the show when it came out, fell in love with it. The guilty remnant in the show is this cult that wears only white, chainsawed, smith cigarettes. They're, um, they don't speak, kind of follow people around town and harass them. But uh, in in the show, the cult believes the world has ended. Uh, the show is about you know two percent of the population disappearing and how to pick up the pieces after that. Um, really, the the whole theme behind the book and the show is about living with grief, uh, living with the loss of people that's unexplained and tragic, and you're never going to get it back. And it happens to tie in well with the material that we write uh, lyrically for what we uh, we're trying to do, dealing with loss, dealing with grief. Uh, relationships falling apart and not like sure. in the, the sappy you know three chord pop punk type thing it just more of like real relationships uh these common human experiences yeah that every, everyone's yeah, relate every, to it everyone's seen uh you know family member get torn apart by a divorce everyone's seen um you know uh, everyone's had a bad breakup some point time in the past and it's uh not necessarily talking about the love, but just the process of going through it. Sure. Um, it's not pining for what was, it's more of just walking through the motions of things ending. And uh, the last words, the last time we're doing tonight, it's, uh, it's kind of at the end of the, uh, it's close to the end of the road. It's um, saying the things that you instantly regret and having to live with the consequences of that. It's, did you ever even really mean it? But it's, it's once it's said, it's that you can't unring the bell. Sure. Well, you know, so who, who does most of the lyrical writing and, and that sort of thing? Is it kind of a collaborative effort? It's, we kind of, Andrews wrote most of the lyrics, uh, especially for the Empty Home. He wrote every lyric on Empty Home. And uh, for the other, some of the other material we're doing, uh, I've wrote lyrics for four songs. And it's kind of like we just, whenever I write a song, I write a song in its entirety. And whenever he does, he does. We don't we don't interfere with each other's lyric writing process. Okay, so you're, so what about your musical writing process? Is that more collaborative or is that again more? <laughs> okay, okay, let's. Yeah, let's tell me let's write this down. We're, we're kind of co-dictators. Uh, okay, that's, okay, that's, okay, yeah, that's I, good. I, I'm gonna say that's a good way. We, we're co-dictators. Uh, usually, we we I will write the drum part entirely whenever Andrew sends me a demo with drums on it to learn a song I I can't even listen to it uh, I, I love I love Andrew to death and he's an incredible guitarist and vocalist but he is not a drummer and uh, it's like it, he started sending me the demos when he when he comes up with some riffs we're gonna put together he'll send it to me um, pretty well formed out like he'll write a song from start to finish where it needs to go guitar and lyric wise and then it's up to to me to put drums to it and then together we'll usually write out a bass line and uh with me him and brad and the drumming aspect of it is uh <laughs> we've had some arguments over that because i've got my hardcore roots that i can't get rid of and uh sometimes beats all the way down yeah yeah sometimes you know you, you want to throw stuff in there and you have to have to, you have to temper yourself back and it's you, you play what the song requires yeah. Um, you don't you don't go past that. If, if the song calls for you to go, you know, boss the wall the whole time, you do it. If the song wants you to sit back there and just groove, you have to do that too. Um, but all the problems are when you go and try to groove, not when you uh, put the balls to the wall. Yeah, it's it's funny because like you know he's he's like you know I don't want a lot of double bass in this, and every time I put double bass in, he's never had a problem. No, no, no uh, that's that's <laughs> entirely inaccurate. I, I write a part with double bass and. Uh, and you're like, no, it doesn't need to be here. Or you try to you try to change the tempo that on was, me. That was once on that uh, on the double bass part because I'm usually not. I'm a that. I'm a totally pro double bass dude. Uh, I've converted them. I'm reminded very much. Have you ever seen the movie That Thing You Do? Yeah, yeah. Where there's you know mm-hmm. they're talking about the song and he's it's supposed to be a ballad and the drummer you know pushes yeah. it and <laughs> so yeah so you kind of push each other and you end up crafting something entirely different than where it started. But it, but it kind of holds the same spirit. It, it begins with the end in mind, for sure. And yeah. it's more of like, what road do we take? Some foresight. Um, it's, the, the songs, uh, 
most of the time we're arguing over minutia in the song and we'll have no, passionate yeah okay arguments. so the the songs don't really change that much no, no, uh no. it's we we argue over minutia and Till we're about to kill each other. Yeah, and, it's, uh, it's like one time we argued over four notes for almost two weeks. What? What? Are you, oh, the waitress. Yeah. In, in Don't even get line. me started. On that. And we came to a compromise on that one, and uh, neither of us like the compromise. We both like our original ways, but the bassist likes the compromise better than both of us, and he's going to be playing it, so we deferred to his judgment. Um, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, and so, he's not here to defend himself. So. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's our, our songwriting process at times can be strained, but it's uh, it's because of our love for the material. Uh, yeah. We think the material's good. We hope people do too, and we don't want to put it out there unless it's a great product. We should talk about the uh, uh, the schism between our material. Oh yeah, yeah. There's uh... so we have uh... <laughs> so, some of our some of the earliest material we wrote together. Uh, is probably going to be some of the later stuff released, and we we when we decided we we're doing this as a thing, we kind of decided to go in a post hardcore direction. And the the sum of our material is two projects. Yes. that needs to be clear. Uh, the, the empty home project, and then the grief cycle. Project. Most most of the songs we played tonight are on empty home, and that is uh, more more rock and more Americana, more traditional rock. Uh, and that's primarily my project. Uh, that's really uh, Josh writes the drums, and, uh, and you know, I basically I demo the song and bring it to Josh. And then, but that's not the project that was originally conceived with the band. Uh, a we have a separate song set based off of the five stages of grief, which we're still working on. And is that empty home or is that? No, that's it's, a separate uh, one. Yeah, it's it's currently untitled. Uh, we do play uh, one or two songs from that live, um, and we're getting uh, one of them. Another song from that will be debuted on uh, the December tenth show at the Soundbox, uh, the Benefit Show. Cool. Yeah, that that should be good. I've uh, we've been we spent like the past three weeks working on uh, putting together a pedal board. Uh, that one is definitely more hardcore influenced i'm going to be doing some uh finger tapping on that one so uh kind of had to put together the effects i need to do that one uh yeah it's uh we're, we're not going to be as a band we're not going to be happy unless we're trying to push into new roads um we don't want every album to sound like the one that came before it sure um, I know ACDC's made a fantastic career out of doing that, and God bless them for it, but you know, not every band wants to be ACDC. So <laughs> it's, it's, uh, Andrew's writing style is basically once he writes a epic and then he's done, and he doesn't want to revisit the same material going forward. And uh, he's completely won me over with that side, because when you see the full scope of it, it makes total sense. And it's, it's kind of like... Uh, you're you're kind of implying more control over my songwriting than exists. Uh, you, the main thing with your, uh, maybe I'm ascribing a little bit of uh, more plan there than was there more design after the fact through hindsight. But yeah, I just I just kind of write uh, whatever I can, and it never it, that ends up being wildly disparate. But that's just the the nature of the beast, you know. As I'm learning to to write songs, and uh, so our mu- our material is is going to be fractured. I don't. We may and sure. we may eventually come up with a cohesive sound, but I suspect it'll be one in terms of production quality more than genre. Yeah, it's uh, our influences are are vastly different in a lot of areas, and then they're strikingly similar in the others um, we both consider Tom Petty to be one of the greatest musicians of our generation and then when it comes to outside influences besides the ones that we share they're completely disparate I have a hardcore background um, he's done a lot more into folk and Celtic stuff and but, that's a coming too that's yeah. coming mm-hmm. <laughs> and the, the thing the thing is once once it's all said and done though once we once we write enough material for an album and it's done it's finished we we've spoken on that and then we move on to the next project um it's going to be better 
early on because everything's kind of released in a similar time. Hobohemia is not on the Empty Home EP. It's kind of a standalone. And it kind of We've, we've got several standalones. Yeah, Charlotte and Kathleen's a standalone. Um, but once we get past the, uh, the Empty Home, we're going to move on to new territory. And it, if it sounds the same... It's not because we intended it to. <laughs> we, uh, uh, it's not. Be- it's not because we're preoccupied with ensuring that it is. Yeah. It's, it's if if it sounds the same, it's just because that's what we wrote at the time. We want to write songs. We want to listen to. The, my favorite thing about this band is that I find myself humming along to our own songs all the time. Um, sounds kind of conceited, but no. when you get when you when you write an earworm and it's good, it's just it's all it's it's awesome that we've been playing some of these songs for almost a year now and we still love playing these songs yeah um, and that's I've, I've talked to like one of my favorite bands I met them after the show and they stopped playing all their material from their first album pretty early on and I asked them why I'm, and they're like well we played those songs for so many years we're just sick of them and I don't want to get to that point so every time we, we go forth and write a new song, we go forth and write a new song. No, you know, it doesn't matter where where we end up. We should continue to bring what we have with yeah. us. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's not, it's not like we're, we're... It's not like we're going to release an album and never play it again. It's just that going forward, uh, we don't, we're not going to hold ourselves to the same... You're not confining yourselves to a genre. Yeah, exactly. Uh, sure. You know, if, if we decide to go synth wave with her next album that's what we do uh you know it's just if, if that's the music we want to write we'll, we'll do it I, i'm not saying like you know when uh, like bon iver uh, or bon iver whatever you want to call him how every album has been radically different from the one that preceded yeah. it. i mean he, he went from an acoustic singer songwriter to a 11 piece band um if we i guess if we you know could afford to have an 11 piece band we'd do it but a little outside the realm of possibility so Andrew, um, uh, we got Josh's take on this last song. Uh, why don't you give us your take on it? The last word. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, the first song for Empty Home I wrote in two, winter of 2014. Uh, the second song was conceived that summer, and that is uh, kind of our flagship song. That cigarette in the back steps. And that song is sort of the, that song definitely captures the spirit of, uh, the time it was written. Uh, just, you know, like, you know, there's a lot of, uh, adjectives in the song to that effect, you know, just summer night, uh, sitting outside on a summer night. And that's sort of the essence of that project or, uh, the atmosphere. So with, with each song it's kind of been easier to write there's been a more cohesive story and uh and focus and uh we capped it out at eight songs i think yeah, uh great. so there's there's a pretty you know it there's a story to it now there's a beginning and middle and end and uh the last word was was the point at which it i i was i stopped struggling with it and uh and just really had had a story going with it that song uh so i wrote the first song for this in 2014 uh the second song a couple months later and then it took cigarette uh it took about a year and a half to write that song and i think it was worth it it's uh that's one of my best but uh it took a really long time to write that one and then it took about five months to write the last word so what's kind of the, I guess, where are you coming from with the, the last word? What's sort of the perspective there? It's uh, the, uh, this is a book called Nickel and Dimed on Not Getting Off, Not Getting On in America about, uh, it's about a journalist who uh, just decided to uh, try living off as a waitress on a minimum wage of uh, and just uh, you know, experiencing the struggles of that, and uh, there was a lot of people I worked with back in uh, 2014 when I was uh, working at a diner. Uh, a lot of people like that, just struggling to make enough money uh, to feed their kids and sure. keep their marriages together. Uh, you know, on yeah, on the compounding problems, uh, it's the 
money compounds into marital strife, compounds into problems with the kids, and everything just keeps wrapping into itself. Basically, to the point where it feels like you have uh, no control over your life, or even you know the people you care about, and uh, and that's that's the idea there uh, about not having uh, you know trying trying your hardest to keep your life together and, and having it torn apart anyways. <laughs> Can't keep this 
Guys, I've had a great time, you know, listening to you talk about your, your shared experience growing up playing yeah. music, and and also I've, I've really enjoyed, you know, just listening to you play. You guys have an interesting sound. It's got a lot of, uh, you know, it, it harkens back to a lot of like the, uh, you know, even the '90s pop rock. You know, I, I could hear some bare naked ladies in there a little bit, but also that's, 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 okay. that's a new one. That's a new one. Okay, that's, that's a whole. You just opened a can of worms right there. Because <laughs> I've been uh, getting, I've been getting those. Uh, comparisons after our for, first show for like six months now and i bypassed the 90s <laughs> yeah so uh our, our, our first our first show we, we kind of canvassed the crowd we're like uh, who like did you like it you know you always kind of like that crippling self-doubt that comes with every uh form of art we were asking people if they liked what they heard and stuff like that and like who do we remind you of and we had like 30 different bands so it was, it was 30 separate bands almost everyone yeah, but, we asked had but something people, new that they were but reminded we've, of we've had I've had multiple Jim Blossoms comparisons yeah Jim Blossoms which irritates me because I don't no love for that band I never listened to them but they listen to the same bands that I listen to that's, yeah. That's yeah. What, that's, is what I take uh yeah, is the is the key there? But you kind of like draw from your influences, and people with the same influences kind of uh, have some similarities in their sound. We we openly wear our influences on our sleeves, and the yeah. thing is that all of us have completely different, and we have very shared influences, and then completely different influences. So that's why I think it kind of sounds like everyone and no one. Yeah. Well, uh, just to kind of wrap things up. Why don't uh, Why don't we talk about where can people find you on online, social media, all that kind of stuff? Uh, Facebook.com slash the guilty remnant, or sorry, Facebook.com slash guilty remnant band at guilty remnant SC on Twitter, and I believe it's guilty remnant band on Instagram. Also, email us at guilty remnant band at gmail.com. Uh, Facebook's our number one access point. It's our hub. We're going to be branching out more social media, but it'll all be centralized there. Yeah, make sure you follow these guys on Facebook. That's the best way to find out when they're playing shows and that kind of stuff. Um, and this show, man, I I've, I really enjoy doing this show. I get to talk to these great bands and get to know them. Um, we appreciate you coming out here and taking the time with us, too. Yeah, for sure. I, 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 I'm glad to have you guys on. Thanks for having me out to your house. It was a lot of fun. Um, we did a video, and that came out last week. If you're listening to this now, uh, this came out. The video came out last weekend. You can find the videos that promote the bands on this show if you go to bit.ly slash hoodoo tube. That's the easiest way. Or, you know what? Just go bit.ly slash hoodoo music podcast. That's the hub where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play. And uh, it's on all the others, Podcast Addicts, Overcast, all of them. So check us out on there and follow me on Twitter at Mark Jones Audio. Until next time, thank you so much for listening to the Hoodoo Music Podcast. <laughs>